Could you start off by introducing yourself? Yeah, my name is Katrin Jakorsdóttir. I am a member of Parliament and the chair of the Left Green Movement. Perfect. Could you tell, um, just for the layman, a little bit about what the Left Greens are about? Mm -hmm. Well, the Left Greens were founded in 1999. Uh, we're like a classic left-wing party in some terms, fighting against inequality, uh, having a very clear vision that we want to have a, a very strong welfare system, an open education system, and we want a fair tax system, a progressive tax system, where the rich people pay uh, more, uh, relatively more than the poor people. So you could call us a classic left-wing movement. But then we're also a green party, and uh, we used to focus maybe more on issues concerning the uh, preservation of nature and wilderness in Iceland, but we have turned now more to climate change and, and what we can do to fight climate change. We're also a feminist party, very focused on gender equality and the rights of women. And also we are probably the only party in Iceland that wants to stay out of NATO and other military alliances. So were you a part of the forming of the Left Greens? No, I, I joined the Left Green Movement in 2002, um, became actually uh, involved in city politics, in, in politics in the city council of Reykjavik. So I wasn't one of the founders of the movement, and of course it has developed a lot, uh, like all political movements. They develop or they die. <laughs> so you can see a lot of change uh, that has been going on in the left greens. Um, not least after, because we were members of the government in Iceland between 2009 and 2013. Mm -hmm. And that experience uh, was a tough experience, but we have also learned a lot from that experience. So I think we've also undergone a lot of change in the last few years after being, uh, after being in government. Um, you had a recent election, and can you just tell me a little bit what that day was like for you, experiencing that election? Well, the last election in Iceland was, uh, it was a good election for the left Greens. You know, we had a 15.9%, which is the second best result for us ever since we were founded. Um, of course, however, the election, it was a, it's not maybe a surprise because uh, the polls had been showing some indications what would happen, but still it was a little bit different from the polls. So we saw that uh, the political scene in Iceland became really more complicated after that election. Now we have seven parties in parliament, which I think is a record for the number of parties in parliament. Um, we also saw that uh, the left wing in Icelandic politics didn't gain a lot because even though we gained a lot, the Social Democrats lost a lot, the Pirates didn't gain as much as they had hoped for and they are of course not a traditional left-wing party, they are more like uh, out of, they, they don't uh, and you know they don't call themselves left or a right-wing party and the right-wing parties actually gained a lot. So you, so you can see that there, uh, so that was maybe even though we were very happy about our results, uh, the results as a whole uh, were not maybe so good for the left in Iceland. Okay, and you and I met back in May, like I think this year, after a citizens meeting, and I saw that you were speaking with Lawrence Lessig. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that conversation with Lawrence Lessig changed the way that you stood on that new constitution. Yeah, uh, Professor Lessing is, uh, he had a very fresh take on the new constitution process uh, because uh, I was of course member of government when we started the new constitution process and uh, I was also a member of government when we hit the wall really in that process. Uh, I have been uh, really thoughtful about what's going to happen to that process process you know because the years have passed and we haven't finished a new constitution uh what Lawrence Lessig said to me was that it was really important to show that the democratic process has worked and that's why it was so important that this whole uh process would lead to some results and i am pretty convinced that uh that's really important because otherwise we have undergone a very original, if you can call it that, process, which was supposed to increase the power of citizens. We had a referendum on it, which was 
should have been a guidance to us politicians on what should happen next. Mm. And then nothing has been done to do that, to finish and, and get some results. So uh, I think Professor Lessig has been an inspiration to quite a few of us on how we can somehow, that it's really of a vital importance that we show that we remain loyal to the democratic process that we started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, in the face of, I, I think that this, this interview is coming at a really interesting time for me and for Lawrence Lessig because mm -hmm. we're both in the States. Mm -hmm. So we are also looking for hope and we are also looking for inspiration. And I, when I brought this example around the world, mm -hmm. the constitutional reform process here, it's very strange. You just see kind of a light come up in people mm -hmm. and it's calling upon this really interesting kind of intrinsic democratic sense that people didn't know they had. Mm -hmm. Do you feel an extra pressure from the global community because of that? Well, yes, because I think maybe what we started uh, and and of course it did just it wasn't just the government or the parliament in 2010. It was a lot of people, a lot of grassroots movements that started the process and it, 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 uh, it was like a cooperation between the public and the political uh, area, which is so interesting because so often there isn't any real conversation between the politicians and the public. Uh, and, and what we have sensed is that maybe the interest has been even more <laughs> coming from abroad than from Icelanders themselves. And uh, I think that people really find this process intriguing and inspiring and maybe we have a unique opportunity because we're so small and so few of us and so it's really possible to do a thing like this um, however um, I must admit that I'm a little bit disappointed in how the two last parliamentary elections uh, the results of those elections now and also in 2013 uh, they are not very inspiring. They, they don't inspire much hope for that we can somehow reach an agreement in the political area on how to finish the process. But I think we really need to remain loyal to the public of Iceland who participated, not only through a referendum, but also through the uh, election of people who sat in the Constitutional Council and also participated in the national meeting uh, in the beginning of the process, uh, I think we have a very strong obligation towards that same public, even though people maybe don't prioritize the issue when they vote for parliament. And I think that shows an interesting paradox that people are interested in a new constitution, but they don't prioritize it very highly on the agenda when it comes to parliamentary elections. Then you can see the focus turning to more classical political issues. Do you think that if people knew how the new constitution affected those issues that are on the table, that it would be different? Well, maybe that's one of the things that hasn't uh, we haven't succeeded in. And that's showing, that's showing that the new constitution might have a real effect on classical political issues. For example, when it comes to uh, the chapter on rights, human rights, uh, which is very closely re related to what we can call a classical welfare political, <laughs> you know, stance or, or policy. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it takes, in the new constitution, the rights are defined uh, much more broadly than in the current one. Okay, so for your job right now, um, could you explain to the layman the complication of where you're at right now in Parliament? Well, after the election, uh, and Probably everybody could foresee that, but you can say that it has been realized that after the election, the political situation in Iceland is more complicated than it has been for decades. Because usually uh, you have a pretty clear vision of which parties are going to form a government after the election and very usually it happens very quickly. Um, right now, uh, we don't have really an idea <laughs> what will happen because uh, obviously there are seven parties, so so the the votes were more distributed than before. 
the classical right-wing party, the independence party is the biggest party. The left greens are the second biggest party. Between those parties is a very wide gap uh, when it comes to uh, political stance and political policy. So we haven't been considered, you know, you know, that would be highly unusual for those parties to work, to work together. And therefore, you can see a quite a complicated situation evolving uh, where you can't really see which parties are going to form a government. Gosh, and so what an interesting job you have right now. Because <laughs> what are those discussions like? Because is it now the wheeling and dealing? Are you guys laying out all your main issues and saying, okay, how can we agree with each other and help each other? What's happening right now in Icelandic uh, politics, party politics, is that uh, the parties have all been really conversing and saying, these are our issues, this is our policy, this is our stance. Um, and then the president of the republic has given the mandate to form a government to the chair of the biggest party, the independence party. He's been trying to form a government and still all very informally. So, so you can't really say that the wheeling and dealing has started because that starts when things get formal and, and people sit down and, and your formal committee is talking together about uh, really on, on, on the details, if you can say that. But, uh, until now, for the last 10 days, people have been more talking about along the broad lines and, and who can really, you know, which parties can work together and which parties seem to have more difficulties in working together. So it's an interesting situation and it's not very common in Iceland. You can see it often, you know, in other European countries. You often see many days and weeks pass without parties being able to form a government. Spain is a recent example, for example, so I mentioned one. In the Nordic countries, it's a little bit different from Iceland because there you have left-wing uh, coalitions and right-wing coalitions that are very clear before the election. And uh, that hasn't been the case in Iceland. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a, a bit of a personal question. Do you have a sewing club? Yes, I'm a member of two sewing clubs. <laughs> like all Icelandic women, uh, one with uh, my friends from college and another one with other friends who are also partly from college partly not so yes and do you find that the discussions that you have in the sewing clubs ever make it back into parliament i think it's really important for a politician to have friends who are not members of his or her political party i think it's really important for politicians to stay a little bit in touch with what normal people are talking about so yes i definitely think that being a member of a group like so Icelandic sewing clubs <laughs> is very important for politicians. Uh, just to stay in touch with normal people. Um, and this is a good advice I got from a friend of mine who is a member of a different political party, said who left parliament after one term, and she said just don't forget to have friends outside of your outside of parliament and outside of your political party. And you found that's helped. It's been, it made X all the difference just to keep sane, to have friends outside of the political area. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, could you tell, so I'm, I'm going to jump back to the Constitution just briefly. What is the hope for the Constitution now with, with everything up in the air like this? Like people that are real constitutional enthusiasts for what you guys did, what can, what do they need to know? Well, I think, you know, I'm a little bit worried about the future of the project of the new constitution. I think we're faced with the fact that we um, we need to think a little bit outside of the box to find ways to make some sort of a broader consensus about what's going to happen next in the uh, constitution. So I must admit I'm not optimistic right now, but I tend to think that there must be a way, though, that we need to find a way and I think uh, for example if we could somehow um, take the constitutional process a little bit out of the normal governmental business and have some sort of an all party uh, arrangement in the parliament on how to how we want to proceed in constitutional changes in Iceland I think that's probably the only way 
to proceed with the new constitution. I'm not sure it's going to uh, give good, you know, give results because, as I said, uh, the fact is that the constitution doesn't seem to have been prioritized in the parliamentary elections because we have parties in majority who are, weren't in favor of finishing a new constitution. But I think that the argument that we all have to be loyal to the democratic process, whatever we think about the everything, all the you know everything in the new constitution, but the fact that we need to somehow be loyal to the democratic process and keep on working on it must have some. Uh, I, I can't believe anything else than in all the parties are people who support that that main idea that we have to be loyal to the results of the referendum in 2012 and somehow uh, work uh, ahead on the process. You're considered Iceland's most popular politician. And so do you feel that that gives you a different position to bridge some of these parties and to speak to them about this? I'm not sure that, you know, popularity is in its nature something that can go away very quickly so i'm not i don't think i have any different position than any other politician uh but i tried i have always tried in my work in parliament even though i'm a member of the party that's at most to the left <laughs> in parliament i've always tried to uh, be able to talk to people from all parties because that's just life <laughs> you know we don't have a we don't have a majority in Iceland so you have to be able to work with other people so I will try and I I did try in the last term to make uh, to work ahead with some constitutional changes with other parties that didn't happen though so that's why I'm not so optimistic but we cannot surrender so we have to somehow continue 